Well, it's time to get started. We welcome you to this session. Uh, my name is Vince Hardy. I'm with the Partnership for Environmental Education and Rural Health here at Texas A&M University at College Station. We're delighted to be here with you and glad you're with us today. We have students from all over the United States, many here in Texas. Uh, we also have students in Florida and Alabama and Tennessee and Illinois and Indiana and Nevada. And we're glad to have you here today. The presentation today is entitled The Scoop on Nutrition and it's brought to you today by the Science Education Partnership Award sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. And for the presentation today, we have three veterinary students with us. We have uh, Devin Smith, who is a second year student. We have Beverly Crocker, who is a third year veterinary student. And our main presenter today will be Leslie Wagner, who is also a third year veterinary student. So without further ado, Leslie, take it away. Howdy guys. Um, today we're gonna talk a little bit about nutrition. We're gonna start out with some pictures of animals and um, I want you to kind of think about their condition and how they look. So do any of your animals look like this animal? You know, maybe they're um, very trim, they have a very athletic underline. Um, on some younger animals, maybe you could feel their ribs, but just slightly. So this is a really good condition for animals to be in. They have a slick coat, they look very healthy, right? This animal is healthy. What about these animals? I bet some of y'all have some animals that look like these. I know my mom sure does. Um, but these animals are fleshy and big. These are what we'd call obese or overweight animals. And what about these? So these are more malnourished or under-conditioned animals. You can see their ribs even from far away. You can see their hip bones. Their skin and their hair coat are in poor condition. This is what we see whenever uh, animals are not getting the correct nutrition. So, Real quick, I want you guys to tell me what nutrition is. What do you think of whenever you hear nutrition? Maybe you think of, I mean, the food pyramid. Maybe you think of diets. Maybe you think of um, whatever, food, junk food, healthy food. Maybe you're thinking of salads. Maybe that's what you think nutrition is. But to me, the formal de definition of nutrition, it's a science, it's a process which means it's got all sorts of steps incorporated into it, and it's a process by which organisms take in, so it's what animals eat and what we eat, and then utilize their food material. So it's about balancing, so it's a balancing act between how much you can take in and how much you utilize. And this is different between every species. So sometimes we see dogs and cats, right? And we think that cats have a much lower utilization, right? They have a much lower energy requirement. So they're going to need to take in less food than maybe a dog that jumps around and plays outside and plays fetch. Or sometimes it's different between a different breed. So if you think about Labradors, they're typically very active dogs, right? They go hunting, they like to play fetch, they like to swim. But one of the most obese breeds that we see in veterinary medicine is, of course, Labrador Retriever. And then you see dogs like Greyhounds. And greyhounds are a very mellow breed. They kind of just relax and walk around. Um, you know, when they're not being raced or anything like that, they're just very chill pets. They like to just lay around. And it is actually really hard to make a greyhound fat. I mean, you have to try, and it's near impossible. So those animals just have a breed predilection to be very lean and muscular. So the main focus of nutrition is the essential nutrients. So there's six essential nutrients. And the thing about essential is it means that it has to come from the diet. Your body cannot make these nutrients, you have to provide them for it. So we're going to talk about water, we're going to talk about fat, carbohydrates, protein, vitamins, and minerals. So first is water. Um, water does a lot of jobs throughout your body, so it's actually 60% of your body. It's the most abundant nutrient that we have in our bodies. And it's a great solvent, so that's why it's perfect for being used as a transporter for waste and metabolic nutrients and all that. And it's also used a lot for chemical reactions. So a lot of chemical reactions cannot happen without water. Or maybe the chemical reaction will produce water. And so that's used a lot in your metabolism. Whenever you break down foods and um, use it for your body, you're either using up water or you're releasing water. 
Another thing that water does is it's actually very hard to raise water's temperature or to lower it. So in that way, it's a very good insulator for the body. It helps keep the body at a certain temperature so that you're not getting too hot or too cold. Um, a lot of your body's mechanisms, they can only function within a certain temperature range. So water is a very important part of keeping your temperature regulated and making sure that your body can function normally. Another thing that water does is it lubricates and cushions all your joints and your organs. So water is a major component, component of like synovial fluid and that's going to be within all of your joints or around your organs to make sure that they don't uh, hit each other. Next we're going to talk about proteins. So proteins are very large molecules and they're abundant throughout your body. So they're made up of amino acids. So if you think about proteins being a train, all the cars on that train are going to be amino acids. So you can um, put them together in all sorts of different combinations. There's only a certain number of amino acids, but there's 10 essential amino acids that you have to provide. Remember, essential means that you have to provide it in your diet, that your body cannot make these amino acids. So you want to make sure that whatever you're eating, you're going to balance your diet with the essential amino acids that you're providing it. And this is also going to vary between species, gender, breed, age. Um, so certain species like pigs, pigs require a lot more lysine than other animals. So whenever you're feeding a pig, you need to make sure that you have extra lysine in that feed. Or whenever you're feeding cats, cats require taurine and dogs don't. So you want to make sure that you have plenty of taurine in your cat diets and you don't have it in your dog diets. Next we'll talk about carbohydrates. So everyone knows what a carbohydrate is, right? So it's the bread. I'm addicted to bread. I love carbohydrates. So <laughs> you have all sorts of different classes of carbohydrates though. They're simple and complex, and your complex can be broken down into starches and cellulose. So your starch is more like your grains, that's what's gonna go into your bread, and your cereal grains, all sorts of things. And then your cellulose is kind of the woody part of plants. It's your fiber and um, that's what's going to help keep things moving in your digestive tract. So you need fiber in order to keep your digest digestive tract going. And then your simple sugars are pretty much made up of glucose. There's different simple sugars, so like honey also has fructose in it, but your main one is glucose. And your body will take simple sugars as well as your complex sugars and break them down into glucose. So that's what you're mainly using as energy source. Carbohydrates are your main energy source for animals and for humans. Um, we don't really have a requirement for carbohydrates, but we tend to eat a lot of them, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and then your cellulose, the difference between your cellulose and your starch is the bonds that hold those glucose molecules together. So in your starch, you're have, you have alpha bonds, and uh, alpha bonds can be broken by lots of enzymes that we have in our stomachs, that dogs and cats have in their stomachs, and that horses and cattle and all sorts of animals have in their stomach. Pretty much everyone can break down alpha bonds. Your cellulose, however, those are put together by beta bonds. And that makes it a little bit different. So the enzymes that we have in our stomach, they don't digest beta bonds. So whenever we eat something that has a lot of cellulose in it, like grass or hay, or if you want to eat a cotton ball, it's going to come out looking exactly the same as it went in. A cotton ball or grass or hay. But when a cow and a horse eat cellulose, they have microbes in their stomachs that can break down those bonds and actually turn them into sugar and volatile fatty, fatty acids that they can use for energy. So they have a symbiotic relationship with those microbes. They provide the microbes with food, and then in return, the microbes provide the animals with energy. Pretty crazy. So we just got done talking about carbohydrates. We're going to take a quick brain break. So, I want you guys to tell me, I'm going to hold up two different foods, and I want you to tell me which one you think has more sugar in it. So I just want to see a show of hands. So, first I have an apple and carrots. So who thinks that the carrots have more sugar? Okay, what about the apple? So, to show you, I have sugar packets, and these are going to represent how much sugar is in each food. So in our carrots, we had 6 grams of sugar per serving, and in our apple, we had 12. So those of you that chose the apple, you were right. Next, we're going to have one of my favorite 
foods, peanut butter and jelly. I'm obsessed with peanut butter. I'll eat it out of the jar with my finger. Obsessed. So, which one do you think has more sugar? Peanut butter? Raise your hands. Okay, what about jelly? All right, let's find out. So, our peanut butter, it's got eight grams of sugar per serving. That's pretty good, right? And our jelly, it's got 23 grams per serving. So that's quite a bit of sugar. So I'm glad I like peanut butter better. Okay, next we have one of my favorite drinks, <laughs> Coca-Cola. And then one of my favorite energy drinks, Red Bull. So raise your hands if you think that Coca-Cola has more sugar. Okay, now raise your hands if you think Red Bull has more sugar. All right, so when we go off of an eight ounce serving, we find out that actually they're the same. They both have 26 grams of sugar per eight ounce serving. So that was kind of a trick question. Sorry. <laughs> All right. But our last one is my favorite, and it's probably what I'm going to eat for breakfast after this presentation. Uh, we have a muffin and a donut. So raise your hand if you think the donut has more sugar. Okay. Now what about the muffin? All right. So this one I think might shock some of y'all because our donut it's got 35 grams of sugar and our muffin our muffin's got 84 grams of sugar it hardly fits on the screen how much sugar is in this muffin so i know if you're as shocked as i was i thought the donut for sure would have a lot more sugar but your muffin is made up mostly of carbohydrates and it's very dense carbohydrates so now it makes sense right that it would have a lot more sugar than the donut So the next essential nutrient that we're going to talk about are lipids. And lipids are what you know as fats, fats and oils, right? So a lot of us think that lipids are bad for you. Fats are definitely bad for you, right? That's what's making you fat. But lipids are actually essential to you. Remember I said that carbohydrates, we have no essential requirement for them, and neither do dogs and cats. But in lipids, if we lived an all-fat-free diet, we would not live very long. Because if you think about it, lipids make up a lot of things in your body. The lipid cell layer of your cells, that's what separates your cells from everything else in your body. Without it, we wouldn't be able to survive. Also, they're a great source of energy. So they're actually two and a quarter times more energy than carbohydrates. The problem is that if you have too much of them or if you eat too many carbohydrates and you're using carbohydrates as your energy source, then you tend to accumulate lipids. And that's where you start to see fat accumulation in the body and whenever we see our dogs that get a little fleshy or a little bit bigger. Next, we'll talk a little bit about vitamins. And so vitamins, there's two different types. There's water-soluble vitamins and there's fat-soluble vitamins. So your water-soluble vitamins are going to be like your vitamins B and your vitamin C. And um, like vitamin C you find very commonly in oranges, right? And it's important to note that water-soluble vitamins, because water is not stored in the body, it's an essential nutrient that we have to take in every day, that we also have to take in water-soluble vitamins every day. They cannot be stored in our body. So that's why you see when people get sick, they need to take vitamin C, because they don't have a store of vitamin C in their body. And it's very important in your immunity. Um, same thing with B vitamins. If we have an animal that is off feed for a certain period of time, or is on the wrong feed for a certain period of time, they'll become very deficient in B vitamins. So we have our water-soluble vitamins and our fat-soluble vitamins. And the fat-soluble vitamins, as you can guess, can be stored in fat. So your A, D, E, and K, those you don't have to take in as much every day, not like the B vitamins and the C vitamins. Uh, some common sources that we see for vitamin A, I mean, carrots, are a very good source of vitamin A, and they're very important in making sure that you have the right vision. Vitamin A works a lot with um, your eyes and making sure that you can convert between uh, different chemicals in your retina so that you can see well. Vitamin D, we know we get from the sun, right? We can convert it in our skin. So that's kind of cool. You don't actually have to ingest vitamin D. You can just kind of sit out and soak it up. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about minerals now. 
So our minerals, we have two different classes. We have macro minerals and micro minerals. And the main difference is just how much of what you need. So all minerals are required in very small amounts, but your macro minerals are going to be required in like maybe 1,500 parts per million. Um, and your micro minerals are going to be required in like 10 parts per million. So quite a bit less than your macro minerals. And they're going to be used for very vital, vital functions around your body. So your calcium and your phosphorus, they're used for your bones. Without that, you wouldn't have strong bones. You wouldn't be able to remodel them. Or um, if you broke your bones, you wouldn't be able to fix them. You'll have very weak bones without cal calcium and phosphorus. Same thing, sodium and chloride, those are used throughout your body to maintain blood volume. It's the main osmotic uh, pull of water into your blood system. So that means that having sodium and chloride in your blood pulls water into your blood, making sure that you have the correct amount of volume to circulate throughout your body. And then you have your micro minerals, and those are also very important, such as iron. Iron is used in your red blood cells, so that's what helps you carry oxygen. So if you don't have enough iron, then you're not going to be able to, say, go outside and run a half marathon because you can't carry oxygen efficiently throughout your body. You'll pass out. You will literally pass out if you're iron deficient. We have a lot of different supplements that we feed our animals. So like my horse right now, he's in training for a horse show. And so he gets ridden for an hour a day, six days a week. So that's a lot of work for a horse. And he's on an iron supplement to make sure that he can carry enough oxygen to support that amount of work. So micro minerals and macro minerals are both very important, even though they're needed in small amounts. Without them, you will not be able to do vital functions in your body. Okay, right, now we're gonna talk a little bit about what malnutrition is. So when you think about malnutrition, remember we're thinking about those animals in the beginning of the PowerPoint that were very skinny and scrawny. You could see their bones through their skin. Their coat looked very poor and rough, right? That's what happens whenever we're malnourished. But you can see in these children, they're very, very frail and thin. You can almost just see their bones. And then in this other small child, it actually looks very large, right? Because, um, and you think maybe that's a fat baby. But it's not fat, that's actually just water weight. And that baby can't hold it together because he doesn't have any muscle strength. They're, he's been eating all his muscle away because he's so malnourished. And so we talk about the leading causes of death in children under five in developing countries is from undernutrition. So 53% of these deaths are undernutrition. So it's a big problem. We don't think about it here in the United States because we don't see a lot of undernutrition. We see a lot of overnutrition. But there are still places out in the world that are not getting enough food. They're not getting adequate nutrition. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about obesity. Obesity is the condition of being obese, and it's an increase in body weight caused by the excessive accumulation of fat. This is one of the most common disorders that we see in our cats and dogs today. So it's kind of an issue where the animal doesn't have as much energy requirements as it used to. Like when you spay and neuter your cat or dog, you actually decrease its energy requirement by 25%. But most people don't realize that they need to cut back on food. And so they just keep feeding their dog and cats. Sometimes they'll feed them free choice. And um, so dogs and cats will eat whatever they want. Or sometimes they just simply overfeed them and they don't exercise them enough. So they don't take them for walks. And it's kind of hard to exercise a cat, but you can play with it. And my cat plays fetch with hair bands. So <laughs> you can actually exercise cats if you try. Um, but we happen to see that 58.3% of cats are overweight or obese. This was a recent survey taken in 2012 and that 52.5% of dogs are overweight or obese. In the country, we see that in 1991, when we looked at obesity in the country and people, um, if you see this map, the lighter colors are kind of lesser degrees. So that light green is less than 10% of that state were overweight or obese. And the light blue is less than 14% were um, overweight or obese, and the darker colors are kind of more severe, 15 and 19 percent, or greater than 20 percent for the dark blue. So this is 1991. This was quite a few years ago, 20 years ago, 20-ish. And then just nine years later, look at the country then. It's all dark colors, pretty much. So we have definitely had a problem gaining weight in our country, and um, we need to realize what's making us overweight and what's making us obese. You know, do we need to exercise more? Do we need to change the way that we're eating? It's all factored into that. Now, when we talk about animals, we don't do a BMI like we do in 
um, and in humans. Humans, we take a height to weight ratio, and that's your BMI. Uh, for animals, we do a body condition system. So we score them on a scale of one to nine, and some scales are one to five, like in dairy cattle, with one being severely malnourished. You can see all their ribs and all of their um, spinous processes through their skin, and nine being extremely obese, meaning you can't make any definition between muscles or bones or anything. They look like a solid, mass of dog. <laughs> so in this scale, five is our ideal weight. And whenever we have an ideal weight, you want to see a little bit of a waist tuck. So they'll come up from their rib, rib cage a little bit and tuck up. You also want to see an hourglass figure when you're viewing them from the top. So if you can see in the figure, in the picture, in number five from the top view, you can kind of see that he comes in a little. He looks like an hourglass. And he tucks up some in the hind from the rib cage. That would be the ideal body weight. We have a lot of ways to manage weight and overweight dogs. So this is just a few of our prescription diets that we offer through veterinary clinics and through the vet school um, by different, uh, all sorts of different brands. But these are all based on trying to get the dog to take in less calories, but still maintain the uh, amount of nutrients that he needs. So if you just cut down on food, like if you feed your dog you know, you normally feed your dog four cups of food a day, and you decide, I'm just going to feed him one cup of food a day. He may not be getting all the essential nutrients that he needs. He might be low on protein. It might make him low on vitamins and minerals. So these are specially formulated to make sure that the animal is getting all the nutrients he needs, but is getting less calories. So RD uh, does that by making sure that there's more fiber in the diet, and that makes your animal feel full and they eat less. And MD does that by making sure that it's a low carbohydrate diet. Because remember, they don't have a need for carbohydrates. So they balance out the carbohydrates by making it a higher protein and sometimes a higher fat diet, which has helped lots of cats and lots of dogs lose weight. Another way that we manage weight, and it's very important, it's not just diet, you have to increase their exercise. So you have to take your dog out on walks, you know, take your dog when you go for runs, let him out in the backyard to play, play fetch with him. And the same thing with cats, you gotta let them play around. Like I said, my cat will play fetch. It's kind of strange, but all sorts of cats will play with feathers. They'll play with little jingly balls and shiny little toys. They like to play and they want to play. So helping them increase their exercise as well as bringing back their diet and cutting back on what they're eating will help your dog lose weight or your cat. The most important thing to realize though is it doesn't happen very fast. So whenever we target weight loss, we want them to lose 3% of their body weight every month. So sometimes it could take, if you have a really obese cat, it could take you a year, a year and a half to reach their target weight. But you have to stay on track and you have to stay with the program. Otherwise, you're never going to get rid of this problem. We also have for dogs and cats, this is our first prescription drug that is for weight loss in dogs and cats. So there's been a ton of them in human medicine. But this is our first veterinary medicine weight loss drug. So it targets the small intestine and it makes sure that the small intestine can't absorb fats. And in that way, it, takes, it uh, reduces the calorie intake. Like I said, the goal is to lose 3% of the body weight every month. And um, so if you're thinking maybe this is something for your pet or if you have an obese pet at home, I would definitely go to your veterinarian and get on a plan and maybe change their diet, increase their exercise, and um, try and work it out and get your dog and cat to lose some weight. Because there are very serious problems with having obese animals. So some of the problems that we'll see are like diabetes mellitus, which is what we um, typically think of as type 2 diabetes, the late onset diabetes. There's heart disease, so you can get plaque buildups in your heart from excess fat. Orthopedic issues, so like lots of our Labradors, they come in with hip issues. And it's because they're so large and so big that they cannot support all those all that weight on their hips, especially if they're already predisposed to hip issues. Being a Labrador and their breed tends to have very shallow cups where the hip where the ball and the hip go. And then there's also liver disease. So the liver processes all of your food, and um, in that way, so it stores glycogen, it stores excess excess glucose and excess fat, and if you are taking in too much food and too much nutrients and it gets overloaded, you can have a lot of liver disease start to show up. So now I'm going to take y'all through a case. 
So this is what we do in, in vet school. We actually look at cases like this, and this is how they teach us. It's called case-based evidence learning. So we're gonna look at Simba. Simba's an 11-year-old neutered male, domestic short hair. So that's what we call the signalman whenever we look at cases. Age, gender, and um, breed. 11-year-old neutered male, domestic short hair. He is 15 pounds. So for a domestic short hair, that one's gonna be <laughs> Uh, a little bit overweight, so that's a BCS of 7 out of 9. Remember, 5 is our ideal. Also, the owner noted that he's had recent weight loss. He's been more lethargic than your usual. He's got polyuria, which means that he is urinating more frequently than usual. He has polydipsia. That means that he's taking in more water than usual. He's drinking a lot more. And he's got a really poor hair coat. And if you see, I have some labs, uh, lab work put up on there. And his blood glucose, so the amount of glucose in his blood, is high, higher than reference normal. It's about three times higher than reference normal. And his urine glucose is high. So there should never be glucose in the urine. But he's got glucose in his urine. These are all classic signs of diabetes. So for diabetes in animals and in humans, we've got two different types, type one and type two. In type one, you're gonna have a pancreas that is unable to produce insulin. So it's either damaged or it's non-functional, it didn't develop correctly but there's no insulin. And so your treatment is based completely on providing insulin to the animal. And this is the most common type that we see in young dogs. And then we have type two, and that's where the pancreas can make insulin, but the body doesn't respond to it, or it's built up a resistance to it. So this is often brought on by high carbohydrate diets and obesity. So you're carrying it, taking in so many carbohydrates that your body can't process it fast enough, and you start to become resistant to insulin, or you start producing less insulin. And this is the most common type that we find in cats. So just a side note, overweight cats, they're two times more likely to develop diabetes. And obese cats are four times more likely to develop diabetes. So it's really common what we see in cats. Some of the symptoms are appetite. It can either be excessive or absent. You can have excessive drinking and urination, sudden weight loss or weight gain, depending on what stage it's on. Blurred vision and cataracts, we see that a lot in dogs and um, weakness in the back legs or neurological disorders, we'll see that a lot of cats, and then thinning of the skin or um, poor coat condition, just because you're not getting enough nutrients like you should. Our treatment, we primarily base our treatment on diet and exercise. So if we can solve a diabetic cat's problem by changing its diet, by cutting it back to that low carbohydrate diet, mostly protein diet, and um, exercising it, that's great. That's our number one treatment. But if that's not enough, then we may have to start an insulin injection program. So every time that they eat, they get an injection of insulin. And that insulin is going to help them put glucose into cells so that it's not just running around in its blood. Again, so a simple diet change can often go a long way. And low carbohydrate diets tend to stabilize the blood sugar. So the amount of blood or the amount of glucose that's in the blood, and therefore making it where insulin is not as needed as before. And in dogs, we've actually found that. If you have high fiber diets with moderate carbohydrates, you don't necessarily have to have a super low carbohydrate diet, but they do just fine like that. Okay, back to Simba. We see that he is lethargic, polyuria, polydipsia, and a poor coat. So we have kind of an inkling before we even do lab work that this is diabetes, right? Polyuria, polydipsia, overweight cat, tends to be older, neutered male cats. So this is classic diabetes. And then whenever we see the blood glucose being so much higher than normal, we know that insulin is not working because the insulin is not taking blood or taking glucose out of the blood and into cells. And now that it's spilling into the urine, we know this is definitely a bad problem of diabetes. So to understand diabetes, we need to know the symptoms associated with diabetes. And that way we can pick up on the classic cases. But there's also a lot of cases where there's mixed problems. So you have diabetes, but you could also have other endocrine disorders. That makes it a little bit more challenging to manage and a little more challenging to diagnose. And then you want to understand the difference between type 1 and type 2 because that makes a big difference in how you treat it. And of course we know that type 1 is more common in dogs and type 2 is more common in cats. And then prevention and treatment in animals and humans are pretty much the same. A good diet with lots of exercise will really help you prevent diabetes. So making sure you cut back on the carbohydrates, Mix in lots of fiber, lots of protein, and get in lots of really good exercise. And you should be very good. So, right now I'd like to open up the floor for any questions. Does anybody have any questions? 
maybe. Well, I had some sent to me earlier this week. Um, and so one of the questions that I got was, can my cat eat dog food? And it's a very common question. And we hear it a lot in the vet school, and a lot of people think that cats are like small dogs. So um, the answer to that is no, actually, your cat can't eat dog food. So it's not a small dog. Their digestive systems may be very similar, but your cat has very specific requirements. Like I said, cats are, they have different protein requirements, but most importantly, cats are carnivores and dogs are omnivores. So cats cannot actually use plant sources of protein and plant sources of carbohydrates. They have no need for that. That's why we see so many cats with diabetes, because they don't use carbohydrates very well, and they're more prone to develop that diabetic um, insulin resistance. So whenever we're feeding our cats, we want to make sure that we have a high protein diet and you want to make sure that they have different um, specific protein, <laughs> protein requirements in there, like taurine, like I said, cats eat taurine. And so lots of cat foods are going to have taurine. If it's formulated for cats, it's going to have those requirements. But if it's formulated for dogs, it's going to be missing those. And if you have a cat on dog food, I guarantee you in two days, it's going to be deficient in something. and It'll be very, very sick. I mean, not even to able to hold its head up sick. And we'll be seeing it in the vet clinic. So, does anybody else have questions? So, another question that I had emailed to me earlier last week uh, was the difference between feeding small animals and feeding large animals. So, our small animals are mostly monogastrics. And a monogastric only has one stomach. Whereas our large animals, they're um, not simple stomachs. They're ruminant animals or not ruminant. <laughs> Horses are different. They're always different. But um, so simple stomachs, they are like our stomachs. So they don't have that ability to break down beta bonds in cellulose. And they don't have any, well, they have microbes, but the microbes don't break down cellulose for us. Whereas horses and ruminants, they have very special stomachs. Ruminants have four compartments to their stomach. Not four stomachs, but four compartments to one stomach. They have the rumen, the reticulum, the omasum, and the abomasa. And so your rumen is basically a huge fermentation vat, and it's got lots of microbes in there. So whenever food comes in, it'll be first digested by those microbes. And, um, and while those microbes are digesting it, it'll be fermenting and creating lots of volatile fatty acids. That's what they use for energy. And that's being absorbed by the rumen wall. And the same thing in the reticulum. The reticulum is kind of where the grains go because it's more heavy and the heavier things are going to sink down into the reticulum. And um, so then once it's been fermented by the rumen reticulum, it'll go into the omasum. And the omasum's job is mostly to absorb water. So it's got, it has lots of leaflets and um, interfolding membranes. So there's lots of surface area there for it to contact food and absorb water. And then from there it goes into the abomasum, which is just like our stomach. So it's going to produce hydrochloric acid and break down proteins and all sorts of things and just move it along and everything else is pretty much the same. And then in horses, they have a simple stomach like us, but then in the back of their gut, the hind gut, they have what they're called is the cecum. So our cecum is like our appendix and it's pretty useless unless you get appendicitis and then it's even more useless so we just take it out. and. Um, but the horses, it's very important. Their cecum has a very important job. That's where its microbes live, and that's where all of the fermentation happens. So the cecum in the large intestine, it can, that's why we can feed horses hay, because they break it down, and then they can use it as energy back there. Um, but horses are also very prone to colic because of that. They have lots of wide areas that then become small areas, which makes no sense. And then they have lots of loopy things that can get twisted up. So we see lots of horses that get colic. And colic is a very serious disease in horses because if something happens to where that gut is no longer moving food, food through, then you can start to lose blood supply to your gut. And once you lose blood supply, then you have all sorts of bacteria that overgrow. You can get bacteria that spill into the blood, bacteria, or um, you know, lots of bad things that happen. The horse usually gets a fever, starts rolling, it's in extreme pain. So colic is a very bad disease, and um, it's caused by poor nutrition, feeding poor amounts of food, if you feed too much food at once or too coarse of a food, or if you're not feeding good enough quality of food, you can cause a horse to colic. They're very picky eaters. I had another question sent in. Oh, we did. 
What about a raw diet? I've heard that those are really good for my pet. That's right. So there's a big craze about raw food diets now. You know, is it healthier to feed my dog raw food and feed my cat raw food? And um, I'd say it's probably no healthier. It's just about the same as long as it's formulated for a dog. There's lots of commercial raw food diets out there. And um, as long as they've been balanced, they'll have all the minerals, all the vitamins, and all of the requirements that your dog and your cat needs. But there's something special that goes along with raw food. So raw food has the potential to have um, kind of a public health effect. It can affect your health. So your dog and your cat, they can eat things like salmonella or E. coli that tend to accumulate on raw food, and they'll be just fine, and they'll pass it through, and it doesn't typically affect them. But if you get it on your hands from either handling their food or from handling their poop in the backyard, which is where it inevitably ends up, then you could actually make yourself sick. So you have to be very careful when you're feeding raw food diets. You have to prepare it in a separate area than where you prepare your food, wash your hands before and after, make sure that you pick up the bowls that you fed them in and wash them so that they don't accumulate bacteria, and always make sure to pick up the poop that you get in your yard, and every once in a while kind of disinfect your yard so that it doesn't build up. So, is that Everyone's good? We don't have any more questions? All right. All right. Thank you for your time.